Hello, welcome to the Eating Disorder Hope online conference two regarding an international overview of anorexia nervosa and co-occurring issues. We are delighted to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Mark Gold. He will be discussing anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, and food addiction as they relate to alcohol and drug abuse. Dr. Mark Gold is the chairman of Rivermond Health Scientific Advisory Boards. He serves as chairman of the Addiction and Psychiatry Scientific Advisory Board and also as the chairman of the Eating Disorders and Obesity Scientific Advisory Board. He serves as professor, the Do Donald Disney Eminent Scholar, Distinguished Professor and Chair of Psychiatry from 1990 to 2014. Dr. Gold was the first faculty from the College of Medicine to, to be selected as a university-wide distinguished alumni professor and served as the 17th University of Florida's distinguished alumni professor. Prior to his <laughs> Prior to assuming that position as chair, he was a distinguished service professor in the departments of psychiatry, neuroscience, anesthesiology, and community health and family medicine at the University of Florida College of Medicine. And with that, I would like to hand over the presentation to Dr. Markle. Thank you very much. It is great to be here. and. You can kind of see at the time that I started in this field, there were very few experts. I had to work in a lot of different departments at the same time. And really that was the same for eating disorders and overeating and obesity as it was in addictions. Because, you know, when you think about it, um, I was the first faculty in addiction medicine in a big college of medicine. And we really had a de minimis um, eating disorder program and um, obesity really just was a program within bariatric surgery and surgery. So um, uh, historically, my career, you know, as you point out, was in neuroscience. And, and you'll figure that out as the talk goes on, but that really means that I was interested in how drugs interact with the brain, how food interacts with the brain, how sugar interacts with the brain, and how those interact with each other so that many times we see uh, people who have um, substance use disorders have disordered eating and people who have disordered eating and eating disorders have psychiatric and addictive disorders as well. So that would be the, the broad outline of the, the talk. I, I've worked for probably 45 years in addiction science and less than that in the 30 years in food eating disorders and um, sugar, but I have a, I had a, a career in anorexia nervosa research where we were studying the hypothalamic pituitary axis in anorexia nervosa in, in um, young women who developed anorexia nervosa before the onset of menses and compared them to um, those who, who um, developed anorexia nervosa after and looked at the differences. And then I had some uh, now classic studies on bulimia nervosa to test the hypothesis that purging, vomiting itself caused endorphin release in the brain and almost um, reinforced um, that behavior independent of uh, the underlying eating disorders. And we studied a number of treatments, including naltrexone in the early 80s in bulimia nervosa. And then I went on to look at binge eating disorder, which was not recognized at the time, but we saw it clinically and then moved into uh, sugar and, and food. So in, in our scheme, there are um, four distinct uh, eating disorders and they have interesting and important relationships to psychiatric disorders and substance abuse. Um, disorders. I'll, I'll highlight some of the, the recent literature and then go back over my past work. So, you know, as you can kind of see in my most cited research, one is on a, be, a behavioral addiction, in this case, problematic internet use, and another one is on 
um, overeating and food addiction. Uh, as I said, I started my own career studying pleasure. And if you do study pleasure, it's hard to study that in animals. They can't describe it, but they can self-administer sugar or, or seek out food or drugs and looked at brain systems involved in supporting food reinforcement, sex reinforcement, and drug reinforcement. And there's a, a great deal of overlap in those areas. And then in chronic use states, um, the brain's reward or reinforcement system kind of shuts down. And that's what we've called and others have called reward deficiency syndrome. And the, the, um, the way that people counter that is by overstimulation, either high risk behaviors, drug use, uh, binge eating, and so forth. And that's to uh, compensate for an overwhelming sense that life is not pleasurable, that there's nothing that you can do to make yourself feel good or feel better and being profoundly depressed. So that I pretty much stuck to that my whole career. Very recently, we've looked at some of the overlap between um, food and drug seeking behaviors and to show that there is a lot of relap, uh, a lot of overlap, especially in dopamine areas and dopamine reinforcement. And keep in mind, you can um, text or email Eating Disorders Hope and we can send you um, articles if there's something that you see that you're particularly interested in. Um, disordered eating, eating disorders um, have relationship to self-injury and that's been described very recently in a, in a, a solid paper where um, non-lethal, a non-suicidal non cutting and so forth is um, part positively associated with both substance use disorders and eating disorders. Eating disorders as well um, have strong and important relationships with um, suicide. And um, uh, the most recent study it would be here, but it clearly suicide is the second leading cause of death among people with anorexia nervosa. It's also elevated suicidal behavior in bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder when compared to the general population. This is especially true because um, individuals with anorexia nervosa are 18 times more likely to die of suicide and other dis eating disorders are also at high risk to die of suicide. So the overwhelming sense of despair, anorexia, and um, the kind of dopamine deficient anhedonia all um, conspire um, to, to make eating disorders and suicidality much more common um, together. Substance abuse only makes that worse because just using a substance might cause a temporary um, improvement in dopamine functionality, but over time, that whole brain system will, will shut down. Mortality in, in patients with anorexia nervosa is greater in the presence of psychiatric comorbidity. So you do have this higher uh, incidence of death and death by suicide, which um, is exacerbated by substance use disorder and making these uh, diseases really important to diagnose. So it's important to identify anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. It's important to identify comorbid psychiatric disorders, and it's important to identify substance use disorders because the presence of one increases risk and the presence of more than one increases risk of mortality and suicide um, greater than one alone. So um, um, how did I get started working in this area? You know, I, I was interested in, in why people eat and how eating is a source of pleasure and eating is, is a social activity. And um, started to think about food and food addiction. Uh, my work was really um, um, solitary work. I had no citations in the medical literature for my work on food, for my work on the interaction between food and substance use disorders or sugar, meaning like no one referenced me other than my students. That kind of changed in 2011 where we held 
uh, what was called the Yale Historic Conference on Food and Addiction. And Kelly Brownell and I co-chaired this, and we brought together all of the experts that we could find in the subject of sugar, food, and addictions. And they were all working in little areas and didn't know each other. There were some working in fatty liver and others working in binge eating and others working in animal models, others working in GI. And we brought them all together. And, and um, really, Ashley Gearhart, who was a, a doctoral student at Yale at the time, helped Kelly and I get this together, invite the people, bring them there, and for us to share. And Nora uh, Volkov, the head of NIDA, was a keynote speaker and presented her work showing that um, obesity and overeating caused changes in the brain that were eerily similar to those produced by alcohol. And we'll um, look at that in more detail, but having NIDA there was really important because you could see that the National Institute of Drug Abuse was going to expand its interest into behavioral addictions not just gambling, but um, eating as well. So Kelly and I did this, and we, we had all the speakers. It was a fun event, and um, we stimulated a lot of interest in publishing and collaborating and worked uh, brought all the speakers together and wrote this book, which, which um, is used to help put people to sleep. But other than that, it, it was the, the compendium of all of the workers in this field. So um, in addiction, we often ask, what makes a drug of abuse? People have thought it was the chemical structure of the drug. No, it's not. Most of the drugs of abuse are unrelated chemically. And what makes a drug of abuse is that simply it's self-administered by lab animals, meaning that if, um, it, uh, if an animal hits a lever and gets a drug, it uh, is more likely to hit a lever again. So what's an addiction? It has binging, just like in binge eating. It has craving, just like a foods and, and binge eating disorder. It has withdrawal or the feeling that you're not the same with it, without the drug that you are with it. It has enhanced drive for the drug, cross sensitization, and increased consumption. And all of that comes together to say, how do we get addicted? Um, we get addicted to drugs like we do to behaviors like sex, gambling, and eating. But for eating, um, it starts early. For drugs, it does start early as well. There's good work on maternal exposure in, in utero um, to drugs of abuse. Tobacco is the best example. Smoking mothers uh, tend to have smoking children because the child is induced to produce more tobacco responsive cells in their brain than they would have ordinarily. And Kelly and the Yale Rudd Center suggested the same thing for fast food. And um, to tell you the truth, this work was, um, was then eventually done at Princeton University where they fed pregnant rats uh, milkshakes and high sugar and found that the offspring preferred uh, these kinds of foods as well. Behavioral addiction is a big field, and food is right in the middle of it. So how did I start thinking of it? I, I started at Woodstock. I started with my own food preferences. I myself like French fries, um, and um, went on to experiences with just watching and knowing um, Saturday Night Live, work at Yale in addiction. Um, and I'll go through these areas where we can kind of see food needing. But it's pretty clear that animals will press a lever for food like they do drugs, especially for sugar. So the work started at Yale. At Yale, we developed medically assisted treatments in the 70s and switched people to naltrexone. That gave us a number of chances to see people in the post-addiction state. And one thing we learned was after people are detoxified, they have hyperphagia, increase in appetite, increase eating, and weight gain. And it just goes wild. On the other hand, when they're on drugs, food is, is not as reinforcing or interesting, and they tend to lose weight. Um, now, Trexone, which is now being given as an injection, long-acting called Vivitrol, prevented relapse and also changed 
some food and alcohol preferences. So for narcotic addicts placed on naltrexone, they drank less, lost weight, and said that they had changes in eating. So our early naltrexone experiences in the 80s with Jeff Jonas, who was a pioneer in binge eating um, research and did the seminal work, uh, pharmaceutical work in binge eating treatments, um, he showed that naltrexone could change uh, bulimic events in, in bulimia, it could change binge eating frequency in uh, what would now be called binge eating disorder, and it could change alcohol drinking interest and preference. Now, Trexone, as I said, is an opioid blocker. It makes a person immune to heroin. Um, it's oral and very active, uh, but long, long, um, the long story made short, most people don't take it very long. Tobacco um, is a, a harbinger of what we see with food. You may remember this. Yes or no, do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnston. Uh, Congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. So such a consensus um, people would probably say the same thing for sugar today, and it's really not true. Um, so uh, just like when we go to discuss eating for tobacco, there's common comorbidities. The comorbidities would be alcohol drinking. Most common cause of death among tobacco smokers is actually drinking. PTSD, attention deficit disorder, schizophrenia, major depression, and compulsive gambling. And who can forget the ads for cigarette smoking, which just gives you an idea that cigarettes um, cause decreased appetite and body mass. And uh, it could do that reliably and almost advertise for that. Um, this kind of research has gone on and on. And here in 2011, we see that yes, cigarettes do suppress appetite. and Nicotine withdrawal induces overeating, and most of it relates to nicotine receptors and uh, feelings. But there's both weight gain after sensation and weight loss with intoxication. Part of it has to do with nicotine, and part of it has to do with the other constituents in the smoke, some of which are MAO inhibitors. But the net net smoking cessation, meaning drug off, food on, is associated with weight gain, reliable weight gain, because of appetite changes. So cigarettes were the first example, but all the drugs really work like that. When drugs are on, food's off, and when post-addiction, there's a change that reverts backwards. So cocaine, methamphetamine, and other drugs used in modeling, used to inhibit appetite, used in weight loss, and by the way, used in patients with eating disorders, both binge eating disorders and bulimia nervosa. Other things that, that interested me in this field were, of course, being a, a person who grew up in the 60s and seeing all the things that were going on. I got to go to Woodstock, and at Woodstock, um, it started off, there was a lot of food and you can see the food tents here in Life Magazine on the left, but after the rains came, the, the food trucks couldn't get in. There was no food, but people never said, where was the food? Um, drugs and food competed the brain for the same reinforcement sites, and as long as drugs were there, um, no one said, where's the food? I learned other things um, about the interaction between substance use disorders and food. Um, being at Yale, uh, first as a chief resident in 78, and then on the faculty, we had the snowstorm of the century. And at that time, um, you could see I was uh, working in 
in the medically assisted treatment program. And at that time, that was principally methadone. We had some patients on naltrexone, but most on methadone. The snow was so thick, uh, but we wanted to keep the uh, treatment program going. So the state troopers picked me up in 30 inches of snow, brought me to the treatment program, and I found that no patients showed up. Even though they, their methadone had ran out and they would have had withdrawal, they, um, they didn't come in because they couldn't get in. So I wanted to know um, what they did. You could kind of see how bad the snow was. There's no way they could make it in. This, we were buried. Um, but I got in because the troopers brought me in. And even though there were 10 feet of snow in some places and wind gusts, 46 miles an hour. Um, I got in and um, went to the storefront clinic, which didn't have any heat and was prepared to give out methadone. Very few people showed up even the second day. And on the third day, more people, but um, still, I didn't have the majority of people. So I, I said, well, what did you do to get by? And they said they um, tricked themselves into thinking that they weren't in withdrawal. They carried or thought about sugar and eating heated sugar, drew it up in the syringe, and moved on to drinking to excess. So vodka was, was the treatment of choice for getting by. So I, I think the, all of this um, pointed out that you could almost substitute food um, is, is a nausea that's associated with withdrawal, but clearly in withdrawal early, sugar and food had a role as well as alcohol. So um, the most recent literature in 2017, current occurring binge eating disorder and food addiction are highly frequent in men with heroin disorders and that patients with substance use disorders should be screened for binge eating disorder as well as other eating disorders because of the high comorbidity, because they're related. Substance use is related to eating disorders. Um, even after controlling for age and eating disorder severity, women with bulimia are more likely than those with anorexia to have alcohol, amphetamine, marijuana, cocaine, and other SUDs, substance use disorders, just like we saw in our patients uh, who had opiate use disorders. They also had alcohol um, abuse and um, used alcohol to uh, mitigate withdrawal themselves. Even in genetic research, we see that, that sweet liking genes and craving for alcohol go together. Um, just to give you an idea about how common it is to think about eating in the, and food, in many ways, alcohol is a food. Um, people have talked about the carbohydrate equivalents. Nor Volka at our Yale conference said that alcohol dependence looked like obesity, looking at PET scans, and alcohol is like the crossover drug, which is a little bit like, like uh, food and sugar, and also a little bit uh, of This is the sleepy island of St. Kitts in the Caribbean. Three hundred years ago, velvet monkeys were brought here from West Africa along with slaves serving the rum industry. Escaped monkeys acquired a taste for alcohol by eating fermented sugarcane left in the fields. Today they satisfy their thirst by raiding local bars. They have learned to be sneaky. Picking the right moment is everything. For years, the monkeys have been studied for insights into our own drinking habits. Just as we vary in our taste for alcohol, so do the monkeys. <laughs> 
Some do anything for an alcoholic cocktail. But just as some people are teetotal, so are some monkeys. These reject alcohol in favor of soft drink. So we can kind of see that, that alcohol and sugar um, have common brain effects and common behavioral effects. And really, the green vervet monkeys of St. Kitts seek out rotten fruit, um, which ferments and becomes like alcohol. So um, here in another very recent study, we see women with eating disorders are higher than peers in um, measuring uh, for alcohol dependence and, and even alcohol-related problems and repeat intoxication, suggesting that we should assess drinking in everyone with disordered eating because the two go hand in hand. Other things that we learned in early Yale days was um, people who were who had given up drugs in early abstinence um, and going to AA and NA meetings looked for meetings where they had great food, great cookies, sugar. They carry sugar in their pockets. And we also learned that when in doubt, um, you could invent a sports drink and no one would drink it. But then when you add sugar to it, you could be the number one sports drink on the planet, which is the case for Gatorade. Cocaine and, and eating are also really uh, related. Um, cocaine's use in indigenous populations is to work at high altitudes and have no food. So cocaine gives you energy and also suppresses appetite. And that's its principal use at that uh, point. Um, Freud gave cocaine to morphine addicts and created the speedball, but um, cocaine was also used as an uh, alternative to dental extraction. And in those early days in the 1800s, late 1800s, it was noted that if you rub cocaine on your tooth, you wouldn't have to pull the tooth out, but also it suppressed your appetite. Cocaine could be used with wine. I'm giving two different highs, but again, suppressed your appetite with heroin as well and reported by Freud. So cocaine was a pronounced appetite suppressant, dopamine stimulator, and then suppressant and could cause and be seen in patients with disordered eating. Looking at just body mass, you can kind of see at Saturday Night Live, you had, you could almost tell when people were on cocaine by their body mass. Off cocaine, heavy, on cocaine, very, very thin, thinner, thinnest. Um, off cocaine, heavy, on cocaine, um, thin. And um, all of uh, the tragedies, um, while not all could be related to drugs, Many were related to drugs um, uh, being there. So our group reported that cocaine could be addicting. This seems ridiculous. But in the 80s, cocaine wasn't included in the DSM as addicting because withdrawal was such a prominent part of addiction. This, by the way, by making cocaine and proving cocaine was addicting, we then could have behavioral addictions or addictions where the pathological attachment, like to sugar, um, would be, or gambling would be great, and withdrawal would be minimal. And we reported on dopamine. So clearly, cocaine depletes dopamine, shown here before and after. Heroin depletes dopamine, shown here before and after. Meth, the same. Alcohol, half of that. Um, and eating um, causes the same. As I said in the early 70s, we showed that cocaine was associated with disordered eating. And we did this by speaking to people who called the cocaine hotline. The same would be for bulimia as well as for binge eating disorder. And we went on to say binge eating but not other disordered eating had a major vulnerability, very, very high vulnerability for addictive disorders. Obesity, as I said, has the same kind of pet imaging as you see with um, alcohol uh, and 
The brain is so sensitized, it's always looking for drug or food cues. Our own research was uh, focused on the role of opioids and endorphins in overeating, in disordered eating, and regulation of appetite, and in comorbidity. Cocaine and eating disorders uh, date back to the mid 80s in our work. Um, and then use of psychostimulants to maintain appetite as well. And there are just a lot of publications, hundreds of publications of our group um, looking at binge eating, overeating, looking at relationships with drug use, looking at whether food addiction is real and how to define it, looking at how food might compensate for a reward deficiency syndrome that could be produced by drugs or could be genetic, um, and how all of that um, could be understood at a brain level. Sugar is addictive is pretty clear right now. It's self-administered by lab animals, just like a drug of abuse. It causes uh, increase and increase escalation in use, loss of control, and both glucose and fructose corn syrup are self-administered by lab animals. There's binge for glucose, there's binge for fructose corn syrup, there's dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, there's dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. It's exactly the same as you would see with a drug of abuse, but with less dopamine. The interesting thing was we could also produce um, opioid with like withdrawal symptoms in the glucose self-administering animals as well. And so Nicole Avina, uh, my principal um, student at Princeton, um, described this in a TED talk that I'll, I'll show you right now. Picture warm, gooey cookies, crunchy candies, velvety cakes, waffle cones piled high with ice cream. Is your mouth watering? Are you craving dessert? Why? What happens in the brain that makes sugary foods so hard to resist? Sugar is a general term used to describe a class of molecules called carbohydrates, and it's found in a wide variety of food and drink. Just check the labels on sweet products you buy. Glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltose, lactose, dextrose, and starch are all forms of sugar. So are high fructose corn syrup, fruit juice, raw sugar, and honey. And sugar isn't just in candies and desserts. It's also added to tomato sauce, yogurt, dried fruit, flavored waters, or granola bars. Since sugar is everywhere, it's important to understand how it affects the brain. What happens when sugar hits your tongue? And does eating a little bit of sugar make you crave more? You take a bite of cereal. The sugars it contains activate the sweet taste receptors, part of the taste buds on the tongue. These receptors send a signal up to the brainstem, and from there it forks off into many areas of the forebrain, one of which is the cerebral cortex. Different sections of the cerebral cortex process different tastes, bitter, salty, umami, and in our case, sweet. From here, the signal activates the brain's reward system. This reward system is a series of electrical and chemical pathways across several different regions of the brain. It's a complicated network, but it helps answer a single subconscious question. Should I do that again? That warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you taste grandma's chocolate cake? That's your reward system saying, mmm, yes. And it's not just activated by food. Socializing, sexual behavior, and drugs are just a few examples of things and experiences that also activate the reward system. But overactivating this reward system kickstarts a series of unfortunate events, loss of control, craving, and increased tolerance to sugar. Let's get back to our bite of cereal. It travels down into your stomach and eventually into your gut. And guess what? There are sugar receptors here too. They're not taste buds, but they do send signals telling your brain that you're full or that your body should produce more insulin to deal with the extra sugar you're eating. The major currency of our reward system is dopamine, an important chemical or neurotransmitter. There are many dopamine receptors in the forebrain, but they're not evenly distributed. Certain areas contain dense clusters of receptors, and these dopamine hotspots are a part of our reward system. Drugs like alcohol, nicotine, or heroin send dopamine into overdrive, leading some people to constantly seek that high. 
in other words, to be addicted. Sugar also causes dopamine to be released, though not as violently as drugs. And sugar is rare among dopamine-inducing foods. Broccoli, for example, has no effect, which probably explains why it's so hard to get kids to eat their veggies. Speaking of healthy foods, let's say you're hungry and decide to eat a balanced meal. You do, and dopamine levels spike in the reward system hotspots. But if you eat that same dish many days in a row, dopamine levels will spike less and less, eventually leveling out. That's because when it comes to food, the brain evolved to pay special attention to new or different tastes. Why? Two reasons. First, to detect food that's gone bad. And second, because the more variety we have in our diet, the more likely we are to get all the nutrients we need. To keep that variety up, we need to be able to recognize a new food, and more importantly, we need to want to keep eating new foods. And that's why the dopamine levels off when a food becomes boring. So here you go. And this is why um, there's been so much consensus. Not only is sugar self-administered, but you can see that it could be used in early withdrawal to calm an addict. Um, food and drugs compete in the brain for the same reinforcement sites. Sugar self-administration is actually blocked by Narcan, naloxone, the heroin antidote. So you eat sugar, you like it. It has addictive properties. It interacts with opioid and dopamine is released. Sugar levels spike, dopamine is released. You get insulin secretion, drops your blood sugar. That fall in, in blood sugar um, causes changes in insulin levels that change fat, but the body then craves sugar and the sugar high. And as the, the blood sugar levels get lower and lower, you get more appetite, more craving, and go on and on. It very much seems like a binge event. Um, so uh, we have all kinds of sugar self-administration, and you can even apparently die. But now, if you think about our old example of tobacco, tobacco smoking is meant to release nicotine. And here you have soft drink, like in the non-human primate monkey videos, seeking soft drink. Soft drink is a vehicle by which you get all of the sugar. No one would have this many pieces or packets of sugar in a serving, but you can clearly see that in a soft drink, that's routine and causes a profound effect. So much so that there have been sugar taxes proposed and sugar proposes the new tobacco because the target's always the same, it's the brain. All of this gets back to uh, binge eating uh, and uh, binge eating, uh, how ironic that the approved treatment for binge eating is itself a dopamine augmenting psychostimulant medication that um, is similar in many respects um, to amphetamines. And so again, you have the old axiom that food and drugs compete in the brain for the same reinforcement site, um, disordered eating um, and drugs can have uh, countervailing effects. There are other um, comorbidities worth considering. Studies of binge eating disorders have shown the prevalence um, is comorbid with mood disorders, as well as a variety of other psychiatric comorbidities. Overall, BED and lifetime mood disorders are very common. Dysthymic disorders, depressive disorders, and substance abuse disorders. All of those suggest, as we said before, that a patient with disordered eating, a patient with a bona fide eating disorder should be evaluated for concurrent psychiatric disorder, mood disorder, and substance use disorder. Those three together put self-harm um, and suicidal thinking and behaviors in the greatest risk category. And just um, Nicole, my old um, student, has a hedonic eating book. Sugar in fruit juice, sugar is added to everything because sugar feels good, tastes good, and causes self-administration. Other things to, to um, keep in mind that show this comorbidity or relationship is that um, 
if you cut off food to a person who eats for pleasure, they switch to alcohol or binge eating. So many times in the post-bariatric surgery cases, yes, it's true there's weight loss, but major risks are depression, binge eating, and alcohol. Um, all these are my publications in this field, not to bore you, but um, you can really see that amphetamine on, food off, and disordered eating off. We eat mostly for pleasure and try to get our brains to react. That's why um, food science um, has developed and, and food presentation uh, uh, has developed. Overeating and obesity are so important, they're ignored. Most of our eating disorders uh, meetings um, try to exclude overeating and obesity. We, most of the obesity medicine is done in internal medicine or in surgery, even though in my field, all of the health gains and health savings in dollars from cigarette smoking cessation have been taken over by overeating and obesity. Type 2 diabetes and obesity are consuming more health dollars than tobacco um, ever did at this point. Food is sufficiently addicting that um, there are debates. What's more addicting, cookies or cocaine? Well, sugar does cause the same effects, but much, much weaker, you know, 600% less. Food addiction is real. It's being studied by Ashley Geardhart. Well, what foods? They're kind of be binge trigger foods. She looked at which foods um, cause you to lose control. And her work, they filled out the Yale Food Addiction Scale. So you have binge eating instruments. We have anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, DSM checklist. And now there's a Yale Food Addiction um, checklist, which is easy. It was 10 items as a reduced item, um, self-scoring, um, but they showed which foods. And which foods don't surprise you. The foods that are the biggest triggers and the most likely to induce um, repeat uh, or self-administration or loss of control are chocolate, ice cream, french fries, pizza, cookies, chips, cakes, buttered popcorn, and down the list. And the least likely are things like water, cucumbers, broccoli, beans, and so forth, um, which have very, very little in the way of self-administration. So science has been thinking, gee, I w what if I could make broccoli that was self-administered like uh, pizza? A, and that gets back to what creates an addictive substance. Um, it's self-administered, it's craved and wanted, it, it, um, it's something that has, produces pleasure, and it's less, um, uh, it produces pleasure like chocolate or pizza would, and less like a banana would. You can really see it in the changes in the food environment, the, the presentations and what's in the food, um, cause loss of control. So it's really hard to just eat one because binging, um, this stuff gets me high, um, this stuff is self-administered, this stuff, um, just seeing the label can produce dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens as if you, uh, the same thing occurred for substance abuse with tolerance, withdrawal, more use, and so forth. So, you can look up the Yale Food Addiction Scale or, and find it. It's all Ashley Gearhart's work. The idea was to operationalize the definition, use the DSM, and find something that would produce a fourth eating disorder subtype and um, that has in, internal validity. Here's some sample items. I kept consuming the same types of food even and, and so forth over time. I needed more and more to get the same pleasure. I had withdrawal, physical symptoms of withdrawal. Um, and what, what she's shown quite nicely is that 
there's more craving, especially for processed food, there's greater risk for negative health outcomes, there's more impulsivity, there's more attentional bias for certain foods, and um, there's more response, by the way, to bariatric surgery and so forth. This can develop early on in um, children and has led to a vigorous debate among parents and public health officials as to whether fast food, sugar, uh, breakfast foods should be given to, to young children because food addiction can occur in the very young, can continue throughout teenage times with elevated BMI and more and more in the way of obesity. You can look at a dessert and just say that, if you like that kind of visual display, can cause dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, can cause um, Yale food addiction, um, and interestingly enough, the cube, like a milkshake on the left versus the water on the right, can help differentiate Yale food addiction positive. Uh, clients from those who are negative very, very clearly. There are some comorbidities with binge eating and com some comorbidities with um, gambling. So you do have these almost three Venn diagrams, anorexia nervosa being out, binge eating uh, disorder being in the same, having some overlap with Yale food addiction and having um, a little bit of overlap, though not very much, with bulimia nervosa. But the, the idea would be to develop defined, operationally defined uh, scales for each of the eating disorders and then treatment specific to these eating disorders and prevention and education strategies specific to these eating disorder categories. And that's uh, been done by Ashley Gearhart and her work with the Yale Food Addiction Scale and thinking about um, uh, drugs versus food as well. And uh, there are a whole host of her studies, again, showing the overlap. So I'll, I'll um, leave on this one, which um, shows pretty clearly that all of the uh, foreknown disordered eating categories have overlap, and then they also have comorbidities with psychiatric disorders such as depression, such as substance use disorders, most specifically um, psychostimulant abuse and psychostimulant dependence, and alcohol use and alcohol dependence. Um, uh, yeah, interesting, um, in pre-bariatric surgery samples where the bariatric patients also had food addiction and met Yale food addiction criteria, they had very little in the way of substance use disorders until after bariatric surgery. So I'll stop and take any questions because we're running out of time and it was a lot to digest, and I hope everybody um, learned something about the relationship of these disordered eating to substance use disorders and to uh, psychiatric disorders as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Absolutely fascinating information. So we do have some questions for you. Um, one question is, there seems to be a philosophy gap um, between the eating disorder treatment community, the addiction community, and then to complicate it further, the dieting community, um, specifically like when Weight Watchers recently introduced this uh, controversial statement about allowing a, a free program of dieting for teenagers, and, and yes. it costs a lot of uproar. How can we bridge those gaps and find ways to respectfully dialogue and pull together our resources? So, I mean, I think this is a big challenge in the field because 
when I was doing like hormonal work in anorexia nervosa, I was in the anorexia nervosa peer group. And when I was doing naltrexone and development of new treatments for, uh, for uh, uh, binge eating disorder, I was still in the anorexia bulimia nervosa group, but, but um, more marginalized. That's been brought in in part, but not completely. And the, the whole like obesity, sugar and food addiction group is totally on the outside. And uh, I think the, um, it's a challenge because the diseases are so different, but they all involve food and eating. Um, the treatment approaches are so different um, and the prevention approaches. So my advice would be to look at the uh, um, field of addiction. Um, people who are working in alcohol dependence um, when I first started, literally looked down on people working on cocaine or heroin, and they were they had separate meetings. And we've all kind of come together in addiction medicine, and now have added gambling and behavioral addictions. I think that's a good thing. It would be good for people in obesity to understand how their messaging might be causing um, eating disorders. Um, by having access to um, anorexia and bulimia experts, they don't right now. Um, it, I have presented to the to the obesity medicine group on the psychiatric and eating disorder complications of bariatric surgery, and honestly, that I have got a, a very um, puzzled response because no amount of disordered eating or even suicidality in their mind um, mitigates the important benefits of bariatric surgery. So they would just focus on, well, you have an obesity epidemic, you have a type 2 diabetes epidemic, and bariatric surgery is the most safe, cost-effective way, the fastest way to reverse that. So therefore, um, we'll screen people for psychiatric and substance comorbidities and hope that the, the number of people post-bariatric surgery that have these complications are less than 5%. And that's pretty much what it is. So I would go back to the early days when alcohol and alcohol dependence was its own separate field. You can kind of even see this in the NIH. NIAAA alcohol dependence still is its own institute. But um, the field is moving toward more uh, sharing and less hostility. Um, and I think that's better. Um, but I can surely understand why people who are working in anorexia nervosa prevention are appalled by the messaging um, that's out there for uh, um, overeating adults and overeating uh, problems. And I can understand why the binge eating disorder um, uh, treatment programs are uh, confused by some of the psychiatric comorbidity messaging, but it doesn't help um, when these groups have no contact with each other. I agree, thank you for saying that. More collaboration would be so welcome. We'll, we'll work towards facilitating that as much as we can here at Addiction Hope. Um, another question was about bariatric surgery, and they referenced a term called dumping, and then um, the, mat, the quick consumption of alcohol and all the flour that occurs with that. Can you speak to that a little bit? In yeah, I'll do something context? really quick, but, but the kind of traditional um, RUNY um, surgery, um, uh, in a way, increases the amount of alcohol that can get to the brain um, in a, a jolt. So what we do in pre-bariatric screening is say to a person, if you like drinking before bariatric surgery, you're going to like it a lot more. So if you have any alcohol proclivity, that will be increased. There are all kinds of vitamin deficiencies and side effects. and We could do a whole session on bariatric surgery, but I just think it's important that people who are experts and 
disordered eating and psychiatry and psychology, um, interview people and try to help with motivation beforehand and interview people after bariatric surgery because disordered eating, whole host of vitamin and dumping related effects and a whole host of alcohol and mood effects are more common than we realize and, and really are the most negative outcomes of bariatric surgery. Thank you. Um, one last question. With anorexia nervosa specifically, their uh, personality style in a, in a nutshell, kind of broad, is very perfectionistic, yeah, um, more anxious, that sort of thing. What is their uh, likelihood of developing addiction and how much do we see that, not just in domestically, you know, I mean, I mean, in my clinical experience, I always thought bulimia nervosa had more substance use disorders, and I, I still think that's true. Um, the uh, uh, people with with um, with anorexia nervosa do have um, much more in the way of of uh, perfectionism and earlier onset and other changes that. Um, may make things like cigarette smoking more disgusting. And there is a, 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 then it would be for someone with another uh, eating disorder. I, I think that the, the ability to um, voluntarily and willfully starve yourself um, is a supreme task. The whole brain is set up to reinforce eating and to, to make um, survival paramount and the idea that you can overcome this through will and the force of your personality is what you're seeing in these kind of personality diagnoses. It's um, quite remarkable and almost impossible to model in laboratory animals. Um, so it, it, a willful starvation is just uh, shows you that the level of control and personality control over brain function and reinforcement that's possible. This, um, when applied to learning, can uh, can cause great achievement and great, you know, uh, great success. But at the same time, uh, can spiral out of control and cause death and despair. So it, it's a. Uh, but I do say. Substance use disorders are can be seen in all, are more common in BED and BN than they are in anorexia nervosa. Depression, despair, anhedonia, and kind of this lack of, that's me saying my time's up, and um, lack of, of experience of pleasure in ordinary life um, is seen in anorexia and is seen in other disordered eating and you can see um, cutting behavior, self-harm behaviors, and suicidal thinking and behaviors as well as substance use. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gold. And um, for our attendees, please note that Dr. Gold's website is in the chat box as well as um, something I encourage you to sign up for, which is research you can use. Dr. Gold covers immense amount of research and studies and disseminates this information in very useful format. So check that out too. Dr. Gold, thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot, and uh, I appreciate participating in such an important educational event. Thanks. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.